All right. Well, thank you again for joining us for a very special holiday edition of Zoom into Archaeology. Uh, my name is Nicole Grenan, and I am so pleased to welcome our speaker today, um, Dr. Tanya Perez, an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Florida State University. And she has so kindly provided us with a cookie recipe to go along with her talk today. And I did have the opportunity this morning to bake my cookies, and they are phenomenal. So if you didn't have the opportunity to bake the cookies ahead of time, I highly recommend uh, going and doing that after the talk. And I'll put the link to the recipe that we put up online in the chat box. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Perez. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, I really do hope everyone had a chance to make the cookies because the few people that um, have made them that I've spoken with so far said that they really like them and um, and well, and you'll know some of the ingredients that we're, we're gonna dive a little deeper into. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Dr. Tanya Paris, and I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Florida State University. And my um, main research focus is foodways archeology. span So I like to study what people ate, but also all of the kind of cultural and social and economic behaviors that go along with food and eating. Um, Specifically, my, my um, specialty area is zooarchaeology, which is the study of animal remains from archaeological sites. And I mainly work in the southeastern US. Um, currently, I have active research projects in Florida, not surprisingly, and um, Tennessee. So um, I will talk about um, the different ingredient, not all of the ingredients in the cookie recipe, right, but some of the more um, popular ingredients or ones that we're used to, used to using in cookies um, and also how they relate to Florida and Florida archaeology since this is um, a zoom into archaeology put on by Florida Public Archaeology Network, which I also thank uh, Nicole and Barbara for inviting me to, to speak here today. So first off, let's see, what are cookies? Um, well, cookies are very popular this time of year. People put together cookie trays to have at parties if, um, of course, not many of us are having parties right now, or to give to friends, neighbors, coworkers, family members, um, teachers, etc. So cookies, you know, they are a thing, and they're, they're a type of food that is separate from other types of desserts um, or sweets. And, you know, a definition of a cookie is that um, there's some you can eat out of your hand versus eating with a knife or a spoon, like a pudding, a bread pudding, or a cake. Um, cookies usually have flour as their base, and um, they can be soft, they can be chewy, they can be crispy. Um, the cocoa picantes are kind of a, a soft, chewy, yet crispy on the bottom cookie, if you, if you cook them the way I cook them. Um, and you know, in English, the word cookie is a derivative of the Dutch word koekje. So um, here on the slide, I have a lot of different names um, for the same word for cookies from all over the world because many food cultures have some version of a cookie. Um, and in America, we have been, I feel pretty fortunate to have so many different types of cookies here because of um, immigrants bringing their traditional recipes with them and recreating them here. And this is my favorite time of year for cookies because there are so many um, special holiday cookies that are only made at this time of year and um, it's really fun to try them all. Uh, you can see in this picture, the those are my Coco Picantes that I baked on Tuesday night. And I used a, um, a cookie scoop, it's like a miniature ice cream scoop and it made them look like a little puffs of chocolate ice cream with chocolate chips in them, which I thought was pretty funny. Usually they're a little flatter, um, but that's one of my trays of them. So the best known cookie um, in America would be the chocolate chip cookie and um, specifically the Toll House chocolate chip cookie. So the Toll House chocolate chip cookie was, was not an accident. Um, it, was, it was intentionally created by Mrs. Ruth Wakefield, who is pictured here in the slide. Um, she was the owner of, of an inn in Massachusetts called the Toll House Inn. Her and her husband owned it. And um, she has actually a lot of 
uh, cooking credentials to her name. And she was really very well known. Her inn was very well known for the food that they served. She even has a cookbook that she, she published um, and the, it's pictured here on the red. So she took an existing recipe for brown sugar cookies and um, added chopped up chocolate. And that's how we got the, the chocolate chip cookie or the chocolate cookie. Um, in 1939, Nestle bought the rights to the recipe and also the rights to use the Toll House name. And then um, they started selling what we call chocolate chips, but these Nestle semi-sweet morsels um, in 1940. And they put the recipe on the back of the bag and they advertised them as something that you could you know, very easily use to make your chocolate chip cookies. And um, this is one of those things that has become part of kind of like the, the uh, pop culture of America, if you don't know, a reference here on your screen. This is Phoebe from Friends, and the the uh, context for this picture is that her friend Monica was trying to recreate her grandmother Phoebe's grandmother's famous chocolate chip cookie recipe, and they they lost the recipe that it, the paper was written down on. So they were you know taste testing um, all these different versions, and uh, Phoebe's like, oh, I wish you know I had contacts to my relatives in France because. She said it was Nestle Toulouse. That you know, that was the my the relative's name that came up with this recipe. And um, her friends were like, "You mean Nestle Toll House? It's on the back of the bag." Thanks. So these are very famous cookies, right? And Coco Picantes are are kind of a riff on um, a chocolate chip cookie, but they go a little deeper. They're a little more decadent and rich than than just your everyday average American chocolate chip cookie. So. Um, I just wanted to give you the little origin story of the Coco Picantes. Um, I first made them, oh, I don't know, maybe 2006 when I was teaching a world prehistory class for undergraduates um, at my former university, Middle Tennessee State. And we were talking about plant and animal domestication in that class. And so for that class, I brought in these, um, these double chocolate cookies, and I added to them cinnamon and chili pepper and cayenne pepper and um, black pepper. I just kind of threw everything in there that um, were different types of spices that we might be talking about in that class. And so for that class, I brought them in, I passed them out to all the students. And then um, as they started tasting them, I asked them to call out the different ingredients um, that would have gone into making these cookies. And I wrote them on the board. And then we, um, they, well, the students had to tell me which of the ingredients um, came from Europe or Southeast Asia or um, the Americas. And so we did it as part of the lesson of, of origins of different uh, food items. And um, I didn't have a good name for them at the time. And so I had a naming contest in the class and people wrote down different suggestions and the winning name was Coco Picantes. And, um, I thank my former student for, for naming them for me because it's, it's the perfect name for them. So today what I thought I would do is um, just talk about the history and, and really the kind of ancient history um, of some of the kind of basic ingredients of cookies or, or the ingredients that we often find in cookie recipes like butter, eggs, sugar, of course flour, and, um, and then I'll also include chocolate, vanilla, and cinnamon. And then, as I mentioned, I'm going to um, have the, their connections, these ingredients connections to Florida from an archeological standpoint. Okay, so first up we have butter. Who doesn't love butter? Um, so what is butter? Well, butter is a um, solid stuff, substance made from cream, which um, the final product has greater than 80% fat, so when it is cool or cold, it is a, it is a solid. Um, and the thing with butter is that it keeps longer than fresh milk or cream. So butter originally wasn't a food item in and of itself, but more of a preservation method, right? A way to preserve um, milk and cream. And um, butter that's made from unripened sweet cream is called sweet cream butter, and it also has less flavor. Um, it gets washed to remove the fatty buttermilk, um, which if it was left in, the butter would taste more sour and um, it, would, it would go rancid quicker. 
Um, salt is added to butter most, time, most often to um, discourage any kind of bacterial growth on it, which you don't want on your butter. And um, the thing with butter is that it, it, once it hits oxygen, it starts to deteriorate and um, it will go rancid. Usually we don't have butter around long enough in our houses to, for it to go rancid um, and we can easily get more at the store, um, which is a good thing, but that wasn't always so. So to understand butter, we have to know where butter comes from, which is of course dairy cows, because we're talking about dairy butter. And um, where, when and where you know, cows first were domesticated. Um, when we think of cows, we generally think of the domesticated taurine um, cow, so Bos taurus, which is the scientific name, and it's in the family Bovidae. And Bos taurus is one of several um, species that have the same common ancestor, which is Bos primogenis, um, is the ancestral uh, figure. And these are two modern or major domestic cattle species, the Spanish taurine on the left and the zebu bull on the right. We're not going to deal with the zebus, just the taurines. So um, as you can see here, the archaeological evidence points to domestication of the taurine cattle in the Fertile Crescent about 10,800 years ago. That's a long time ago. Um, ancient DNA analysis of cattle from archaeological sites in this, in this area, especially in Iran, um, show that, that modern day taurine cattle descend from about a group of about 80 female aurochs. Um, those are the maternal ancestors. Um, by about 8,500 years ago, um, I'm sorry, 8,500 years before present, so about 10,500 years ago, cattle were introduced into Europe. And the earliest bones of a domesticated cow in Europe come from a site in Greece, and those date to about 10,000 years ago. Um, oh, this is out of order. So this should have come before the map slide, but this is basically a painting in a, cave, a very famous cave in France, the cave, uh, Lascaux Caves, where there are a lot of paintings of different animals. And this is one of those um, ancestral cattle, the Bos primogenus. So um, they were around for a long time. People knew about them for a long time. They had you know, uh, familiarity with them, probably hunted them in the wild um, before they eventually become domesticated. OK, so the spread of cattle um, took various routes to various places. And the one that I was most interested in was looking at the um, cattle moving into Spain which occurred at about 9,000 or between nine and 10,000 years ago. And um, they, were, they were imported into Spain via the Mediterranean coast, coastal route, which is not terribly surprising. Um, but there's more from the archeology span side of, of early cattle domestication. So there's um, some art, there was a group of archeologists that did isotopic analysis of pottery residue, or residue on pottery fragments, which you can see here in the upper part of the screen. The little black speckled stuff is the residue. And um, the isotope analysis basically tells us what the chemical makeup is of that residue. And the residues from these particular pots um, show that they held some kind of dairy product in them. And the fat content indicates that it was, it was like buttercream or, um, I'm sorry, butter, milk, or cream, or probably butter. And these date to about 11,000 years ago. So um, cows were used by humans, not just for meat and hides, but also their dairy products were really important from a very long time ago. Um, because you don't have to kill the cow to get dairy, so it keeps producing that food item. Now, in terms of how do you store butter, when you don't have refrigeration, well, uh, you can salt it. That's one way to do it. You can also preserve it in, um, in peat. So in Ireland, there's, I wouldn't say there are a ton of cases of bog butter, but these are some examples of um, butter that has been recovered from Irish peat bogs. And you can see I put the dates up here with them. So um, 
Some are, are quite old, right? AD 775 is about 1300 years old or not quite 1300 years old. That's pretty old butter. Um, they're usually wrapped in something. It could be an animal bladder, like the one in the upper, upper portion of the slide, or they could be, have been put into a wooden container um, that was put into the, the um, bog for long-term keeping. And you know, these probably were lost. They probably couldn't remember where they left them. And so that's how they, they turn up um, hundreds of years later when people are, are um, going out and basically harvesting peat to use as fuel for, for fires. Now over on the, the bottom right corner is not a bog butter, but it is butter remnants from um, an underwater site in Scotland. It's, this, it's called the Scottish Cranog Center and this particular site is called Oak Bank Cranog. And they have this wooden dish with holes in it and it was used to make butter and they were able to um, get these butter remnants off of it and have it tested and it, and it came back with all of the signatures for butter. So butter was a thing for a long, long time. And I'm so glad because it's so good in baking. So when did cows first come to Florida? Well, um, the Spanish introduced cattle to Florida from the very beginning of their expeditions and forays through the peninsula. Um, how well any of those particular cattle survived um, is anybody's guess. It's highly likely that the earliest cattle from the 1500s didn't, didn't survive on their own. Um, the Florida cracker cattle, which is pictured here, um, it's, it's considered a criollo cattle, which is a, uh, a breed that originated in Europe, but uh, was born in the Americas. Now, the Florida cracker cattle is is a descendant, most likely a descendant, of cattle raised in Spanish communities that were established in the 1500s and the 1600s. So it has been around for a very long time. Um, here in Tallahassee, or closer to home, cattle were well established in, in this area, which is called Appalachie Province, by 1690. And um, they appear to have been a successful venture, um, for the most part, you know, the cattle herds could free range. Um, there are complaints by Appalachian um, communities about cows trampling their agricultural fields. Uh, people that lived at Mission San Luis, we know ate more beef than any other animal meat, and um, they definitely consumed more beef than their counterparts in St. Augustine, because there were cattle ranches around them. Um, the secondary resources of cows, so things like milk and things that are derived from milk, so butter and cheeses, um, were very important parts of the provincial economy. And we know that the first deputy governor um, of, of the western part of, of uh, Spanish Florida established a cattle ranch not far from San Luis. Um, residents of the Mission Patali, you can see it here on your screen, it's kind of the middle mission site, um, which is today located out Buck Lake Road in Tallahassee. So these residents complained that cattle from the cattle ranch owned by Marcus Delgado damaged their crops. Um, and in the early 1560s, uh, Manuel, the chief of Asile, which is also another Appalachian mission, um, objected to a, the cattle operation that was on the coastal lowlands between their community and another community of Avita Chuco because the cattle were basically threatening their food, right? Um, they were eating acorns and palm berries and, and basically in competition with the um, Appalachian residents for those resources. We also know from historic documents that, um, that the governor in 1693 of Spanish Florida purchased more than two tons of salt beef, three steers and three calves to be eaten by members of his overland expedition that would leave from San Luis to Pensacola or Pensacola Bay. He also purchased 22 locally produced cheese, wh cheese wheels for the trip. Um, and all of these items were supplied by Marcus Delgado who owned the, um, the cattle ranch Our Lady of the Rosary. So we know that you know, from historic documents, it's well established there were a lot of cows here and cattle ranching was becoming a thing. And we also have evidence of people eating cattle at that time. 
but it wasn't just the meat, right? That was important, it was also dairy. And dairy is mentioned in some of those historic records and also in Spanish recipes from that period, from the Spanish mission period. So we're talking mid to late 1600s. Um, at Mission San Luis, which is pictured here, uh, milk cows were likely pinned near, in, nearby in the community or within a short walking distance to town. Um, they could have been taken to grazing areas during the day after they were milked. Um, and also, it could have been that they were kept in areas outside of the town on nearby farms with milk brought in daily. Uh, historic documents uh, record the occurrence of, of milk at San Luis um, because Juana Caterina de Florencia, who was the wife of Deputy Governor Jacinto Perez, demanded, quote, she be given an Indian to go and come every day with a pitcher of milk for the house of said deputy, end quote. So um, here you have a reconstructed Spanish house, which may have been lived in by uh, Juana Caterina herself. And also in the picture of artifacts, I've circled two of the pitchers that may have been used for um, carrying milk back and forth or have it, keeping milk in the house, on the table, um, what have you. So there is circumstantial evidence. And then cattle ranching was something that was taken up by the Seminoles and the Miccosukee um, in the 1700s and is still practiced today. They, um, they have a big cattle ranch down at the Brighton Indian Preserve. And these are historic photos of Seminole Indian cattle ranchers. So a long tradition that we can trace the roots all the way back from present day to the, the 1600s. Our next ingredient are eggs. Um, and by eggs, I mean chicken eggs. There are lots of birds that, that have eggs that people use, but, but we're looking at chicken eggs. And we'll start the story of eggs with uh, where and when chickens were first domesticated. So chickens are a domesticated form of the um, red jungle fowl, which is Gallus gallus, and it's the upper one on your screen. Uh, the red jungle fowl comes from Southeast Asia. The earliest evidence of domesticated chickens come from China around uh, 5,600 years ago. And then we have evidence for domesticated chickens about 4,000 years ago in the Indus Valley. Um, chickens then moved, or well, actually people moved chickens with them, right, into the Middle East. So um, they, they're easy to move around. They, they, uh, they are, became a favorite of many cultures and cuisines. And um, let's see, here you can see the different areas of um, early chickens and chicken, where chickens have moved to and kind of like their progression uh, temporally. Down here, this is from a study done in China on some of the earliest um, evidence for chicken domestication and here's some of the bones that they use to test for this. And there's even a clay chicken figurine from Pakistan, which animals uh, being portrayed in different types of artwork is something that archaeologists look to as evidence um, for domestication or close relationships with humans. So chickens um, were first entered or were introduced early on into Florida and Appalachia province and they became another commodity that could be grown here and then exported um, from here typically out of the port of St. Mark's in Historic documents record um, in 1685, one, about 100 chickens were part of the cargo loaded onto a ship at St. Mark's that were to be traded elsewhere. That's quite a few chickens. Um, we've identified chicken bones at Mission San Luis. Eggshells have been recovered from the Mission O'Connell site, which is um, on the east side of, of Tallahassee. Though they have not been identified specifically to chicken, that's something that we need to, to further investigate. Um, but eggshells do survive in the archaeological record. And um, at Mission San Luis, we've identified chicken gastroliths. And gastroliths are small, hard objects that chickens will ingest to help grind up their food. Um, Jerry Lee, who is the senior archaeologist out at Mission San Luis, has identified the ones that are here on your screen. 
Um, you can see from their descriptions that sometimes chickens will just about ingest anything, any kind of hard object like chert, which is uh, stone that people use to make tools out of, glass, quartz, ceramics. I know the ones that I've um, seen in the, uh, the soils that I excavated in 2018, or I worked, my students excavated with me, we identified a number of gastrolis as well. Um, we know from, from recipes from that period that eggs and chicken broth were very important components of Spanish cuisine. Um, and they were uh, especially important for days on which um, people had to abstain from meat in the Catholic faith. There's a cookbook that was written by a Franciscan friar in, in, um, in 1645 that makes, makes um, has recipes for roasting uh, uh, capon, which is a type of chicken. It's a specially treated type of chicken. Um, for making sauces with egg yolks, for adding hard boiled eggs to soups. So it's no surprise that chickens were an important um, food item or animal item to be raised here in Spanish Florida. Okay, sugar. Um, we think of sugar as white sugar and brown sugar. Um, and the sugar that we use is, is actually from the sugarcane plant, uh, which is native to New Guinea. And um, by about 10,000 years ago, it was being cultivated in both India and China. And the first description of a sugar mill used to process sugarcane comes from an Indian text dated to about AD 100, so that's about 1900 years ago. In 327 BC, travelers from Greece and Rome to India brought back some of the sugarcane to the Mediterranean, um, and they treated it as a medicine, not as a food, um, which it was well known um, in India and China for its medicinal qualities. Around AD 650, so about not quite 1400 years ago, um, the Arabs mastered, had, had mastered the, sh um, the growing, processing, and cooking with sugar, and they elevated it from a medicine to something that only the elites had access to. So it was a, it was a rare delicacy for elites. Um, and when the Arabs were off conquering other places and peoples, they took the knowledge of sugarcane with them and helped spread that to other places. Sorry, my dog is barking in the background. Uh, and from, the four, from about 1400 to the 1500s, uh, Spanish colonizers set up sugar plantations first in the Canary Islands. And sugar is a pretty labor intensive product to be grown and processed. And they needed a lot of human labor. So they imported enslaved Africans and they also enslaved indigenous peoples in the Canary Islands to, to deal with the growing and processing of sugarcane. It became a huge export to Spain. <laughs> and um, there was a growing demand for sugar in Spain and Portugal. So they had, they had to um, expand their sugar plantations to feed that growing demand for sugar which meant that sugar plantations came into other parts of the Americas. It also meant they imported an increasingly large number of enslaved Africans to labor on these plantations. Um, in the 1600s, Europeans tried and fell in love with coffee, tea, and chocolate, which meant that the demands for sugar only increased. And again, to meet the demands, the British, the Spanish, and the French, um, had to increase the production of sugar, which meant the um, importation of over 500,000 enslaved Africans uh, to, into the Americas to labor on these sugar plantations. Now, archeologically, we don't have a, a lot of evidence for sugar um, from the archeological record in Florida, but sugarcane is still grown in Florida today around Lake Okeechobee, and the sugar that's the sugar cane that's grown here is used to make um, white sugar, of course. Uh, here on your screen, you can see in this map, if you look at the purple lined areas, they're basically outlining um, sugar cane production zones. So, so more or less all of Lake Okeechobee is surrounded by, by sugar cane operations, which is an industrial process and, and it has its own um, issues, right, as a, as a 
byproduct of that. So from the sugar cane plantations of the 14, 15, and 1600s, which depended entirely on human labor, you can see here now um, the whole process is mechanized. You might have someone driving a truck, but for the most part, mechanical machinery has taken over the harvesting and, and processing of sugar, which has made it a lot cheaper. Um, okay, next, I feel like this is a very whirlwind tour of ingredients here, global ingredients. Next, we're moving on to flour, and we're talking about wheat flour, um, which is um, the, the main type of flour found in most cookies. Um, and the domesticated wheat that we think of today um, is a domesticated variety of emmer and icorn wheats, which um, originated, of course, in the Fertile Crescent. And the best um, evidence that we have, or the earliest evidence we have for wheat domestication is as early, well, as early as 10,400 years ago, possibly as early as 15,000 years ago, and specifically in the southeastern part of Turkey. Um, there's a mountainous region there where emmer and icorn wheats uh, are, have been identified at these very early dates. Wheat's a whole big thing. It's got a really long, interesting story, but that could take up a whole lecture in and of itself. Um, the earliest evidence for wheat used in baking um, comes from Egypt. So the earliest evidence is dates to around 8,000 BC, which is about 10,000 years ago, and likely would have been baked into kind of round flat breads. We think of them as maybe a tortilla or a pita, like a small flat bread. The, the conical loaves that are shown here, and these are actually preserved loaves of bread, um, were made about 4,500 years ago. And there are actually these little conical loaves that were used as mortuary offerings in tombs in ancient Egypt. They're kind of cool looking though. Um, when did it first come to Florida? Well, there were wheat ranches around Tallahassee. Um, they weren't super successful, not in the same way that cattle ranching was. Um, but we do know that the governor Salazar Vasilia established a rather large wheat farm um, that, let's see, in Appalachia province. Um, and he brought in, uh, quote, two experienced slaves, eight horses and mules, 11 yokes of draft oxen, a millstone, and the necessary plows and harrows, end quote, to his farm in Appalachia to ensure that it was successful. Uh, when he died, his successor, um, dismantled the farm and basically sold off all of the items, including the slaves. And we don't have any documentation, at least to date, to, to know where they went. We just know that they were sold off. Um, the, land, the land itself that had been the wheat farm was returned to the Appalachies. So it was a rather large wheat farm, <coughs> which didn't work very well in this area at that time. So some smaller wheat farms were established. Um, it was grown on a smaller scale for local use and occasionally um, to be exported either to Havana or St. Augustine. The Spanish were pretty adamant that they tried to grow wheat here. That was one of the parts of their um, food ways that they needed to, to transplant here into Spanish Florida. In large part, it was so that they could make communion wafers for um, Catholic communion because wheat has to be used in the bread. And here you have a picture of the reconstructed church at Mission San Luis. Um, no evidence of communion wafers has survived at, at any of our sites, but preservation of organic remains like plant remains, animal remains, food remains is, is not good here. Okay, so the Coco Picante's recipe uses cinnamon. Um, and that's kind of a classic um, ingredient from the Americas when we think of things like Mexican hot chocolate, right? It has cinnamon in it. Um, but true cinnamon or Ceylon cinnamon is indigenous to Sri Lanka, right? And that Ceylon cinnamon is, is known by that name and it has um, a different flavor than other types of cinnamon. Um, it's, it's been popular for a long time. It was written about in the fourth and fifth centuries by Greek historians and um, 
and they knew that you know it was a special type of cinnamon versus other types. So it's Ceylon is not the same as as a cassia cinnamon, which is another type. It's actually more plentiful. The cassia is more plentiful and it's less expensive to grow. Um, in the United States, both Ceylon and cassia cinnamon are used often interchangeably. interchangeably um, and probably most people don't even realize that there are different types. Now in the Americas, there is a type of cinnamon called canela, which is sometimes called a wild cinnamon. And when Columbus landed in Cuba in 1492, he um, was presented with, with canela or wild cinnamon. I don't wanna say he discovered it because it was already known about. Um, but you know, one of the main reasons that Columbus and, and other, earlier, other early explorers went, even went out you know, sailing around the world was to find the sources of spices that were so desirable so they didn't have to rely on their trading partners, right? They wanted to, um, they wanted to not have reliance on, on people that were not their allies and um, this was a huge, a huge deal for them. So finding even this kind of wild cinnamon in the Americas was a, was a big deal. Um, I, was say. I mean, other people in the Americas knew about, about the um, canela cinnamon. So it wasn't, it wasn't newly discovered by Columbus. I just wanna make that point. Vanilla, um, vanilla is one of my favorite uh, spices, and it's, it comes from an orchid, the vanilla orchid plant, which is native to Mexico and Central America. Uh, it grows very well on the fringes of the Mexican tropical forest. Um, it's the earliest use, that, use of vanilla that we know is attributed to um, the Totonac community in Mexico, which is in, in the state of Veracruz on the Gulf Coast. They um, would gather the seed pods from the orchids that were growing wild. Later, they domesticated the vines and, um, or they cultivated the vines, I should say, um, which can take up to five years to mature. So this is a slow growing spice. Um, each flower has to be pollinated the one day that it blooms or you won't have uh, any fruit that year. And in Mexico, the vanilla orchid co-evolved with its pollinator, which is the melipona bee, which is a stingerless bee, which I have pictured here. And um, a decline in bee population has kind of threatened, threatened the, uh, the vanilla uh, industry. Um, Let's see, it's expensive because it has to be pollinated naturally. Humans cannot pollinate vanilla orchids. And, um, and so real true vanilla is you know, very, very expensive. Now I will tell you, I just watched a segment of America's Test Kitchen a couple weeks ago, and they did a, a test of vanilla extract and imitation vanilla extract. And they found that imitation vanilla works just as good for like, a very large, small fraction of the price, like pennies uh, per ounce or something versus dollars per ounce. So I thought I'd just throw that in there. Although I still, I still prefer um, full strength real vanilla to imitation, but they said it was okay to get imitation vanilla. So I'll believe them. Um, okay, chocolate. So this is the big one, right? The chocolate. Um, Chocolate comes from the fruit of the cacao tree, which is native to Central and South America. Probably many of you know that. Um, the fruits of the cacao tree are called pods and they're pictured here on the bottom of your screen. Um, in the pods are the beans, the cacao beans, and to make them edible, they're dried and then roasted. And um, what we know about chocolate is that um, its scientific name or the botanical name of the tree is called Theobroma cacao, which translates literally to food of the gods. Um, Europeans first tasted chocolate in 1519 um, when Cortez uh, was greeted by the Aztec uh, Emperor Montezuma, and um, they gave Cortez and his army a drink of chocolatel with and when they were visiting Tenochtitlan, chocolatl is a is a type of drink that was made in Mexico by grinding up the cacao bean into a paste, 
mixing it with spices um, and honey, but not very much honey. It was, it was a bitter drink. And then the beverage, after it was all mixed up together in a special pot, uh, was poured into special goblet-shaped cups from a height. So they would pour this like up high, and this pouring of this hot beverage created it to foam and froth um, at the top, which gave it kind of a special quality. And, and it's, this drink is known to be bitter. Um, chocolatel or cacahuatl was a bitter water or bitter tasting drink, so it was not sweet. Um, but it was it was highly regarded. It was a highly prized drink, and only certain people in Aztec society could could drink it. Um, it was written about in the Florentine Codex as uh, being a drink of the nobles. That sometimes it was infused with chili water um, and and also vanilla, and that the process of making this drink was described, again, as pouring it from a height so that it would have a frothy head on the top. Um, when Cortez left Mexico and returned to Spain in 1526, he probably took some cacao beans with him. That's, that would not be terribly surprising. But the first commercial shipment um, is recorded in 1585 when a load of beans was sent from Veracruz to Seville. So for almost 100 years, Spain had access to cacao beans um, and the preparation methods of the Spanish, uh, or I'm sorry, of the Aztec drink, cacahuatl, but they kept it a secret um, until it was somehow introduced to Italy in 1606. And from there, it went to France. And then all of a sudden, it's a very popular drink. And you had chocolate houses that spread all over Europe. Sometimes they were... Um, alongside coffee houses, which were very popular at the time. And um, they weren't seen very favorably by some people. They were seen as kind of places of people gambling and, and whatnot, so like pubs maybe, but with chocolate and coffee. Um, in the 18th century, uh, the personal physician to Queen Anne, Sir Hans Sloan, mixed the chocolate with milk instead of water and um, this became a very popular uh, recipe for a lot of people. He eventually sold his recipe to a London apothecary. And then later, the um, recipe was acquired by the Cadbury brothers. You probably recognize that name, Cadbury, right? Because it's on a lot of chocolate bars and other types of candies. Um, and, and that's how it kind of got out into the world. That's how it got its industrial start. So we know about. Um, the early use of chocolate in Mesoamerica from things like the codices where they're written down, but also from ceramics like this pot that's pictured here and others where the, the residues on the inside of the pots or that are absorbed into the, the pots themselves have been tested for their chemical composition. And it comes back with two of the um, chemical signatures for chocolate. So that's a, another way that we know about it. Um, we don't have any chocolate from Florida, so uh, we, and we, have, we have no, no residues that have the signature for um, chocolate from Florida. So that's something that we could, you know, we could look for, but um, I, I don't know that we're ever going to find it here that, that old. Um, so it's been a very whirlwind overview of kind of like the ancient history of some of these ingredients. And I, I hope that um, as you make the Coco Picantes or even other cookies uh, that you're, you're planning to make this holiday season, that uh, just some of what I, I mentioned gives you a pause or something to think about when you're, when you're baking cookies and, and, um, and thinking about like, wow, like what we're producing today really has this very long in-depth history um, that connects us to people all over the world and, and people from, you know, 10,000 years ago. So I hope that you will make the Coco Picantes and I hope that they become one of your favorites as they are mine. So I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. That was a wonderful presentation. Thanks. I love how you connected kind of the kind of the longer duration history with the more recent um, Florida archaeology. That was really interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free. You can unmute and ask a question, or you can type questions in the chat box. Oh. Okay. 
I have a question. Stop sharing so I can actually maybe see people. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste the link to the cookie recipe again into the yeah. chat box for Rebecca. And I can vouch, I was actually eating my cookies during the presentation. I can vouch for how delicious they are. They do they, I used a scoop on mine too, and they came out nice and fluffy. No, they look like, mine look like little scoops of chocolate ice cream. Yeah, they're delicious. <laughs> um, I will say that, that they are a little addictive, but um, I think I told Barbara, try not to eat more than two at a time because they're so rich, right? With butter and sugar, they're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be a good candidate with like a cold glass of milk as well. Yes. <laughs> oh, thanks, Laura. Glad you enjoyed it. Yes, him and I. Penzi's is the best. That's where I get most of my spices from. Is this a, is that a store local to you? No, Penzi's is a, um, they have some storefronts in, in the, probably the closest to here is Birmingham, Alabama, and you can order them online. Okay. Um, look them up and get their catalog. It's just, I just drool over all the things. Um, okay, great. Their, their ground cumin is my favorite. And mm -hmm. you can order, you know, you can order it in different quantities. You don't want to order too much because, you know, spices go stale after a while, but, um, but sometimes I've ordered them and just kept them in the freezer. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah, I freeze a lot of the things I don't want to go bad. <laughs> Spices. Merry Christmas to you too, Erica. Oh, good. I don't see any questions. questions. So that was very thorough. Thank you again so much, Dr. Perez. That was a wonderful talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't wait to throw this up on YouTube because I think we'll get a lot of traction there too. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, we will have one more Zoom into Archaeology presentation that'll be next Thursday. One more for 2020, I should say. That'll be next Thursday. And we're going to be talking about a new digital history initiative here at the University of West Florida. So Dr. Jamin Wells of the University of West Florida History Department will be talking about their project and how local communities can interact with it. So that promises to be a really good talk as well. So in the meantime, have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us. Make the cookies. I promise they're worth it. <laughs> yep. Bye, everybody. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Perez.